All righty, y'all. It is officially the top of the hour. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this is the Mountain Plains Disaster Health Response System webinar, and today is February 5th, Monday. Uh, my name is Caroline Pierce, and I serve as the Program Director for Disaster Health at the Mountain Plains RDHRS. And again, we are incredibly excited to have this expert panel presenting today on the webinar titled Chemical and Toxicological Planning and Response in Region 8. So what is the Mountain Plains RDHRS? The Mountain Plains Regional Disaster Health Response System, established in 2020, is a cooperative agreement funded by the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response, also known as ASPR, and is hosted at Denver Health and Hospital Authority in Denver, Colorado. The Mountain Plains RDHRS works co collaboratively across Region 8, and it Region 8 includes the states of Colorado, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, and Utah to improve medical surge and augment clinical specialty cap capabilities and capacities for large-scale and catastrophic events. And RDHRS is a regional entity working and building within the foundation of the Department of Health and Human Services, ASPR, Healthcare Preparedness Programs. And through this, an RDHRS brings together and convenes partners to share and highlight the planning and response structure for healthcare preparedness. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting all four poison centers serving Region 8 for an hour-long webinar. And during the session, please feel free to use the chat functionality to answer any questions, as we will have time to answer questions at the end of the discussion. And then, of course, if we don't have opportunity to answer all of the questions, we can pull those and follow up at a later date. Now I'm going to hand it over to Chris Hoyt, Dr. Chris Hoyt, the Medical Director of the Rocky Mountain Poison and Drug Safety, to begin the session. Chris, over to you. Hi, everybody. So thank you for participating in this webinar. And um, this is a, obviously an important topic um, for today, um, in today's world. And um, so it's a good opportunity to talk about what, how poison centers sort of address uh, chemical disasters of various ilk, uh, whether or not it be accidental from, um, you know, train spill or um, something intentional. Um, we're going to talk today about sort of what role do poison centers play in this and what value can we bring for um, the people that we serve and how we work with our, our stakeholders and our, and our collaborators. Um, so we've got a great panel today. Um, and so there's, uh, yeah, I see Dr. Shreem Banerjee, who is the managing director of Rocky Mountain Poison Centers on here. Um, John Cole, who is the medical director um, in Minnesota, uh, that covers North and South Dakota. Um, Kathy Jacobitz is on also, um, who is the director of the Nebraska Poison Center, who covers Wyoming. Um, and we have uh, Dr. Mike Moss, who is the medical director for the Utah, uh, state of Utah's Poison Center. And then we also have uh, Dr. Sam Lee, who is the managing director for uh, Minnesota as well. So we've got a great group of very smart individuals to um, have this discussion. And so I thought that we would, from there, jump straight into a clinical uh, scenario, sort of to um, facilitate this conversation about what poison centers do, um, what sort of challenges we have, how we work together, how we work with other um, um, stakeholders. And so, oh, here's a disclosure slide. I think, Carolyn, you want to um, go walk the, through the disclosure for the um, RDHRS? Yeah, absolutely, Dr. Hoyt. Um, so the Mountain Plains Regional Disaster Health Response System webinar is funded by the uh, ASPR number listed on the screen. The content of this presentation is a product of the individual presenters and does not represent the official policy of the U.S. government. And the information is not meant to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And also of note, the panelists have no relevant financial interests or relationships to disclose. Dr. Hoyt, back to you. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, we're going to talk about sort of the infrastructure for, you know, uh, chemical and uh, to major toxicologic disasters that happen across the United States. Um, we're going to talk about sort of what the resources available that Carolyn sort of what, talked about a little bit, but we'll get back to what um, resources are available in this particular region and region eight that we're talking about today sort of how poison centers um, will address those, what strategies we use to address these sort of disasters, um, and um, how we can help you sort of make your um, plans well-rounded and involve a poison center when you need to, to get sort of um, expertise from our certain perspective. 
So we're going to talk about a case scenario. So let's suppose that we have um, an unfortunate attack. And so obviously um, there are some, we re read this, when we're talking about this case scenario, there are some real life sort of um, components to this, but um, a large metropolitan area, there's a sarin uh, attack. Um, a, and sarin, as we all know, is a, is a really highly toxic nerve agent um, that has been used before in very crowded metropolitan areas. Um, let's suppose that in another densely populated area in the United States, there's a coordinated attack in several very key and very uh, high, highly trafficked locations where ser sarin gas is released. Um, and let's say that there's a, you know, it's a very high potency, um, very rapid um, this particular agent has a very rapid onset of action, so time is of the essence, and it proposes a, an immediate risk to um, to life um, with people who are exposed to this. So, um, in this scenario here, as you can read, there's a uh, there's a busy subway, shopping center, public park. So this is a, a coordinated attack where people. Um, regularly traffic these areas um, and so there's a very big exposure so hundreds of people to get exposed to to sarin um, and so we all so the symptoms that are, are you know this is an um, it's very similar to it acts as an, an organophosphate so you're going to get respiratory distress some people have seizures loss of consciousness so it can be high um, low blood pressure states um, a lot of different um, clinical manifestations that are immediately threatening to life um, so there's a lot of hospitals that are in the vicinity. These hospitals are starting to receive a large volume of patients who are exhibiting symptoms of sarin exposure. Um, the emergency departments that we all work with are quickly overwhelmed by the volume of patients, the severity of the conditions, and, the, and, the, and also very important early on things like decontamination, supportive care. Certain antidotes that need to be used um, are there's a strain on them because there's a high volume of patients that it's not been accounted for really um, so for uh, times when you are trying to stock these things or be ready for a disaster. You've sort of gotten to the point now where you might start outstripping your capacity. So next slide, please. So there's a little bit of a shortage. Um, uh, and so the hospitals are facing this critical shortage, especially these essential antidotes such as atropine and pralidoxime. Um, and these are crucial, obviously, and very important um, to help save somebody's life from the effects of sarin. Um, and so now we have um, a, a situation where we have a, a, a demand and a capacity mismatch. So the, we have to think about like where are we going to get the, the antidote to help some people who are critically ill from this exposure. So the challenge here is how do we mobilize emergency resources, staff, um, to quickly respond to the volume of very sick people that these hospitals are getting. And you can see here, so communication, coordination, public safety, resource management, and in, in inter-hospital collaboration, as well as inter-poison center collaboration are going to be very important for us to be successful in um, getting the outcomes we want across the board for our patients. So with that, thank you for, uh, showing the, uh, for sharing that. So with that, we want to have a discussion, and I'm going to ask a couple of questions to this panel um, about this particular scenario to give you an idea of what we do um, and sort of um, what sort of uh, ways that you can sort of plan if you're not a poison center, how you can plan and coordinate with us in order to, you know, to um, for us to be partners in in uh, getting the best outcomes we can for our patients. So, with all that, um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. So for the for the group. Um, with this particular this particular um, exposure and this in this particular attack, what are some of the first things from your poison center um, would you all do um, with this particular um, in this particular um, situation? What are some of the first things that your poison center would do um, to address this particular exposure? Um, from a response perspective, because it, immediately you think we're going to start getting flooded with with calls. And I think from my perspective as the managing director, I would think we need to be saying the same thing. And so uh, drafting some kind of unified messages and unified um, output is, is probably high on my list. Um, and then invoking some of our clinicians to start preparing similar questions for healthcare providers that are going to soon see seeing these patients. Um, and so that that was my first thought is we got to get the message out and we got to be standard and unified. Very nice. Thank you. Dr. Beige, Dr. Moss. Well, I think 1 of the 
biggest things up front is just uh, you, you told us this was a sarin attack, but we may not necessarily know that uh, immediately unless whatever responsible party starts saying that, but presumably they wouldn't and people will start showing up. And of course, we can all go from the Tokyo subway attacks, which I suppose is your inspiration for this, right? And realize that someone pulled the fire alarm and so someone thought there was a fire and then uh, people show up uh, in like private vans before EMS brings them in and then you start having patients beforehand. So I think part of um, our importance is we'll start getting calls and we'll be doing some detective work immediately to even recognize what's happening. Uh, so when there is an unknown attack, a poison center is so important to help decide what are you even dealing with in the first place when all you have up front are symptoms, but you don't actually know what the poison or the chemical uh, is to begin with. Yeah, and that's a really important point that Dr. Moss made because we do a lot of detective work and a lot of times we don't know exactly what is going on or what the substance that's involved is and we haven't identified it. And so having a poison center on board is very valuable very early on, as Dr. Moss said. Dr. Lee. Um, you know, I'm going to echo the first two responses, but I think one of the biggest thing is to, within your poison center, have a plan in place to deal with these big massive exposures because you're not going to see it coming or you don't know it's Aaron. Um, so for our poison center, you know, we've had a couple of experiences with, you know, like a ricin, potential ricin, just being able to have your, your staff recognize something that's going on to elevate it up to the medical and managing director to get the fellows on board to have that communication going. That way we can have an understanding of what's going on so we can then reach out to our public health. Um, you know, CST, FEI, whoever's needed to get involved. So just having, you know, that team huddle right away before we start tackling. Yeah, so like internal communication you're talking about, right, Dr. Lee, is that it's important to get that message to everyone very quickly and have a plan, I think, very quickly to escalate. Um, Dr. Cole? Yeah, uh, I echo everything, obviously, that... Uh, Sam Lee, of course, said, um, I think one of the things that I've learned through our experiences through the years is that uh, information changes very rapidly and having, uh, as Dr. Lee said, a central place to um, reflect on the communication that's done so far uh, to make sure that we're working with the most up to date information about what the substance really is and it does it matching the patients, as Dr. Moss said is really, really critical. So having a centralized uh, uh, uniform place for communication is really, really key. Kathy, I think you were gonna say something too. I think I saw your hand go up. Yes, thank you. Um, I agree with everything and uh, that was stated. And I would just add that, um, yes, the scenario will change. Um, we do our best to give our partners um, particularly the hospitals and public health entities, a heads up with at least what we know and what we've experienced. And so we often work with our healthcare coalitions um, to help, you know, get, get the word out so that all of our partners are at least aware of what's happening. And then um, certainly we get our medical staff involved to put together a one pager just to um, at least let them know um, what might be happening um, when, when they encounter patients. Certainly, we customize our treatment recommendations for the individual patients, but we'll put something out there um, in generalities, um, if it's a nerve agent, at least to give them um, some clinical information so they know what to expect. And then, of course, they call us for specific treatment recommendations. Yeah, very, yeah, obviously very important. And you touched on sort of talking outside the poison center, which is very important, uh, Kathy. So I want to, I want to hold on to that because we're going to explore that, but that's an important piece for what we're talking about. Uh, Dr. Lee. I really like Kathy's uh, mention of having the one pager and with a lot of poison centers, we all now have better phone technology where we all have IVR systems and we can. Um, a lot of time in emergency situations, record a message saying this is happening, um, give them call or some information, um, whether it's, you know, readjusting the IVRs, press one if you're experiencing any of these organophosphate symptoms or something to triage. That way the public, when they call you, they can kind of get some background information, whether or not they need to stay on the line or you can provide the information check certain page, the one pager for more details to help with that, you know, potential rush of calls coming in. 
Very good. I think we have a question. Uh, Steve? First of all, I want to uh, say thank you for uh, allowing me to talk at this presentation this morning. I am the uh, countermeasures coordinator um, through the State Department of Health for the state of Wyoming. Um, the only thing I didn't hear mentioned at this point was a forward thinking as far as the pre-positioned chempacs that are through ASPR and the uh, HSS department, which are pre-positioned aspects exactly for this scenario. Um, hospital packs that have roughly eight, 850 doses and EMS packs that have about half that number, about 450. So I just wanted to promote the early activation to get those resources moving early. Yeah, you make a good point about that, um, especially this, but, uh, with a lot of places with the Kim Pack program. We're going to talk about antidote shortages, and so you're right; it is it, it, it's it's an important thing to do early. So I agree with you, Steve. We will touch on that in a little bit later in the presentation. But thank you for bringing that up, and we will come back around to that. Um, I wanted to ask you all. So you all, the Poison Center leadership, when what is your role? So as managing directors, medical or medical directors, what is your role early on when you have identified that there's a disaster at some point and things are starting to escalate? Dr. Lee. I feel like I'm Vecna from Stranger Things, the one that <laughs> spreads her arms out and connects everyone. <laughs> and so, you know, I think a lot of time my staff will call me first, like, hey, Sam, this is going on. And that's when we start to, you know, do a group chat with the medical director, the fellows to figure out the next plan. And then reaching out to, you know, our public health entities, um, you know, fortunately for uh, we've had experience with these situations and we're involved in a group called multi-jurisdictional exercise team in Minnesota, which involves the Poison Center, Department of Health, FBI, uh, the National Guard, CST, Fire Marshals. Um, so we've done a lot of exercises on the communication. Um, and so with South Dakota and North Dakota, while they don't have that full group set up, we do have um, certain partners like the FBI who also work for the Dakota. So being able to take that experience, reach out to the same person and have them reach out to more people. So spread out those arms. <laughs> yes, Dr. Banerjee. Yeah, I think um, our role is similar to what Sam just said. You're kind of like the incident command or the point of contact. So um, you're kind of um, organizing and sharing information appropriately. And, you know, that escalation piece can, yeah, is huge because we don't want to just be managing things on our little spoke of the wheel. We want to make sure all partners are involved. Um, and so it's really just, I think, being the point of contact um, for our respective center. And then also reaching out to other poison centers um, who may, because calls trickle over. Um, and if all of our, uh, you know, lines are busy, perhaps we might need help, like some surge capacity from other centers as well. And so I think it's a matter of you know, being available 24 seven for any kind of sentinel events such as this and being able to escalate appropriately and coordinate all the proper um, processes are being followed. Doctor, thank you, yeah, absolutely. Dr. Moss. Oh, I think you're on, I think you're on mute. Sorry, I didn't click. Uh, our... Our staff would, of course, uh, recognize something is going on and uh, notify one of our on call toxicologists who's uh, always there. That would probably make it up to me and our managing director pretty fast after that, who would hopefully start getting information out to whatever, you know, EMS or hospitals managing a patient. Well, simultaneously, I would be trying to get in, try to get in touch with national guard you know cst or law enforcement whoever's on the ground to find out information to be talking to our state medical countermeasures coordinator um, of whoever else knows things so we can be on the same page whoever is going to be making some statements to the public from the, the state level to give them information so like like we said from the vecna of doing lots of things simultaneously going both you know up lateral above us down to the patient level being prepared for panicking public calling us as well as physicians calling us from the hospitals to figuring out what's happening to getting our state colleagues and law enforcement and everyone else on board so it'd kind of be all hands on deck immediately in every direction i think nice john cole I think you're on mute too. 
Um, <laughs> uh, I agree with everything Dr. Moss said. Um, I, I think from the medical director standpoint, uh, I think of it as sort of two buckets. The first is just the, the clinical medicine, you know, what to expect, what resources you need, and then communicating that with all the interested parties. So uh, the affected institutions, uh, and then of course, um, uh, your own staff about what to uh, anticipate when people call the poison center. And then the second bucket to me is the public face of, of interfacing, you know, with media when that typically, when something like this occurs. And again, there it's about resources and triaging, but doing it in a way that the lay public can understand and, and hopefully use to get either to the right place uh, to get help or to not overcrowd the system with um, trivial complaints. We're good. And Kathy? So um, I kind of wear two hats as well. I have the public health side, which I'm very involved with. And so I would be working in with those notification aspects and, and um, coordinating communication. But my top priority as the managing director would be to make sure operationally that, you know, we have enough staff uh, to the extent that we can get enough staff and uh, any, any partners um, that could potentially be able to help us out um, with staffing. And then can the callers get through and are we not tying up our lines um, so that all of the routine poisonings and the calls from hospitals that are unrelated to this are not, una you know, not able to get through. So we have, as things has been brought up already, but we have a separate line, a separate queue. Uh, the ability for to bring in staff who would just access that line or our specialists would be able to handle um, the, both calls, uh, types of calls, depending upon what staffing we have and what we need. So those would be some of my top priorities. And so, you know, I want to kind of segue into that and thank you for bringing that up, Kathy. So what happens when you all, so, you know, we, 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 there's a disaster that happens somewhere, but people are still calling us asking us for expertise, you know, and some sort of exposure or whatever questions they have. So what happens when your line now has been overrun with calls about this particular disaster, but you still have people calling in about other things? So what do you do in that? What are your strategies in that scenario? Well, what we would do is because we have a separate um, line that's, that's back with multiple telephone lines, but we can um, do, I think it was mentioned already, we can change our frontline menu so that we would potentially be able to route. Um, if you have a call about this uh, disaster, you know, you're press one. If you have other poisoning concerns or emergencies, press two. So we could at least um, from the front end route those over. But then, of course, the big um, challenge is okay, who's going to staff all of those calls? Um, we do have some um, remote pharmacists who have helped us out um, very quickly in the past. When we've had some incidents, um, we have a number of rotators and students. We, you know, quickly get them on board. And of course, somebody said it'd be all hands on deck, so everybody would be involved. Um, I know all of our staffs have the ability to get on very quickly remotely and uh, help out right away. And so those would be some of the strategies that we would use. And um, I think just with our relationship uh, that we all have together as as poison center directors. Um, you know, if, if, um, anyone, um, on this webinar or really anywhere else, uh, in the poison center world would call me, explain what was, go what was going on, then of course we would be willing to help. And so I think I'm sure we would help each other out and, uh, an emergency situation, you know, we would make that work. Um, perhaps what we might do, what I might do in that scenario is say, okay, since we're more intimately involved with the disaster and the situation going on here, um, we would manage those calls Would the other centers maybe be able to, could we divert some of those more routine calls to them? And, um, that would probably be the way we would manage that. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds, that sounds good and comprehensive. Does anybody have a different way that they manage? Um, their center uh, than Kathy when there's a demand to capacity mismatch? Or is that pretty standard across the board? Pretty standard. Okay. Um, Dr. Banerjee, I know that you talk about um, very importantly in, uh, the importance of in, like efficient case triage. How important is that during disaster times like this? And so, sort of what is the strategy around making sure that that's um, a priority during these times? 
Uh, I mean, I think it's hugely important because again, you need it to be synchronous. You don't need people giving different advice to different people. Um, and so very efficient case management is, is necessary and kind of, you know, almost making a standardized um, procedure of this is how to handle this kind of call and don't spend, you know, you can't spend that much time with each one. So you need to move through the probably the burdening queue um, pretty quickly. And so um, I, I think that that is very important to be on the same page. And uh, that also goes back to um, what Dr. Cole said about media, because you might have somebody uh, contact the news and said, well, the poison center told me to do this. And, you know, that's all you need is having more mixed messages. And so um, not having staff talk to the media, you know, having a very robust process for those kinds of calls coming into, um, I think all these things are important to make sure this can move as efficiently and, and accurately as possible. Very nice. So we all obviously would agree that our stakeholders and our collaborators are very important to work with during these times. And so we've talked about hospitals. We've talked about like emergency medical services. You know, uh, Sam mentioned the FBI. Who else is on your sort of SOP from your poison center to get in touch with in, in times like this? And I think uh, Mike mentioned um, the Coast Guard, but who else sort of is your, um, you know, sort of routinely you would reach out to this group or that group during a time like this? Go ahead, Kathy. Okay, thank you. Um, well, when we um, do a mass notification, we, of course, make sure that we have our um, public health partners on there. We also, our public health lab is um, notified and, and, of course, both state and, and county health officials. Um, I had mentioned before the healthcare coalitions. Um, you know, we work more closely with some than others, but um, in Omaha, for instance, we have um, a healthcare, the Omaha Metropolitan Healthcare Coalition that um, since 1999, um, I have chaired the pharmacy uh, subcommittee. And so we are an additional resource to provide um, pharmaceuticals that we have some stockpile of and we share. So, um, you know, I have examples and stories that I can share if we have time, but uh, those would be some examples. Um, and and when, when you're involving yourself with a healthcare coalition, you know, you have the four aspects. You have EMS, you have um, public health, you have emergency management, and then you also have hospitals. So it's a nice, well-rounded group that, you know, they should all be involved um, during any type of disaster. Very nice. Anybody else have a different group that they um, reach out to during this time as part of sort of like routinely you reach out to them? I don't know if every hospital in our area has a designated uh, physician, but uh, at least at the hospital that Sam and I work at, uh, there's a designated medical director of disaster preparedness. And so having that as a as a, at least internally at uh, at Hennepin County Medical Center, which is the hospital where we work at in Minneapolis, I know that person, and that would, no matter what's going on, if it were to have any kind of potential to need system wide resources, I would contact that person, even if they were uh, contacted through other means. But yeah. that might be a, a local anachronism. Doctor Lee. Um, as a pharmacist, another uh, group of people that we'd be reaching out are the pharmacists of the different health systems that are in the area, because they will also be the ones that will assist us with antidotes um, or procuring or figuring out what they have in their pharmacies or uh, using their network to get more meds as needed. So, yeah. That makes sense. In, in Denver Health, we have an emergency manager. So, John, some, somewhat similar to what you're talking about. Um, we have a person um, that has someone that's there to sort of coordinate some things on the ground if it's in this particular area. I think probably some hospitals have a similar setup to what you what you described as well. Um, so, Sam's point about about pharmacy and resources is really important to uh, emphasize because some of the treatments, not in this case. But some of the treatments are really expensive uh, and require uh, a lot of pharmacy just investment to keep. And so, like, for instance, 
um, digifab fragments, we can end up going through a lot of them really, really quickly. And we have some uh, agreements in place with larger hospitals in our metro area here in the Twin Cities uh, to be able to activate them at a moment's notice if we do need a large store of something. And so the planning ahead of time makes a big difference in, on the pharmacy level for antidote allocation. Yeah, Dr. Banerjee. Um, just to quick mention that the you know poison centers uh, we upload our data to a national data repository and um, we have partners on the CDC who also are doing some surveillance and so um, letting them know also what what's what's going on I think um, would be a, another piece of the puzzle um, to make sure they are informed um, and then they have their own network that they um, launch out notifications to as well and so you know if I was to code a case with you know, ricin that would send up a trigger. They have a series of trigger and algorithms that um, this causes this to occur. And so they would question, why do you, you know, tell us more about that case and what's going on. And so getting them, um, you know, they would quickly get involved just because the cases would come through, but giving them a heads up, I think would be um, important to do. Yeah, very nice. Yep. Um, you know, I think it's a good, we, we, we talked about sort of, we kind of started getting into what would happen um, in the event that we have these antidote shortages. So kind of piggybacking off what Steve said earlier um, in his comments. So I'm interested to hear from you all what, so if you, you there's a hospital that calls you, they suddenly got an influx of, I'm making this up, 15 patients who are ill, who require, and you recommend, they call you, you say all of these people need antidote. Um, and they call you back to tell you that they don't have the antidote at their particular facility. What do you all do? Kathy? Okay, so what we would do is, first of all, we would, so all poison centers do um, annual surveys of antidotes that the hospitals carry. So um, we would already know uh, the hospitals in the area, and, and again, it would probably be deep, be depleted quickly, but we would know what hospitals carry pralidoxime, um, you know, what hospitals carry atropine, which would be all of them, but um, we would look at that. We also would look at, um, are there any um, type of local uh, stockpiles? Okay, and so we actually do have some through, again, through the Omaha a Healthcare Coalition. Um, we've had some funding where we have been able to supply Pralidoxine vials to the hospitals, and it is um, dependent upon you know funding, but we've been able to do that. So that would be the next thing I would do. You know, my staff would probably be calling me, going, "Okay, they need additional supplies, or we have it all in our database. Let's look and see if there are um, any stockpiles or any other meds available locally." Um, but again, that would probably be depleted fairly quickly in a scenario like this, and I would be thinking about. Okay, we'll try to utilize those local um, resources, any stockpiles. We have a, an Air Force base nearby. Um, we have a relationship with them, with their pharmacy. So I would contact them as well. And just, you know, the VA has a stockpile. Every, everyone um, that I knew that could quickly mobilize some resources, but I would not be forgetting about the CAMPAC. I would be, we would be opening that sooner rather than later. Um, this doesn't apply to all states, but in Nebraska, um, we are, our poison center is the 24 seven number to call to request a chem pack. And so we are authorized to go ahead and, uh, and authorize that. And I think it works well, because if we're getting a call anyway, and somebody is calling us saying, Hey, I want to request a chem pack. Of course, we're going to be asking questions, right? Well, tell us a little bit about the scenario. We're already. Um, doing, taking a history, doing, a, doing an assessment and giving treatment recommendations. So we're already aware of the case. So we're already thinking about what resources are needed. So in a situation like this, we would be immediately thinking, okay, if it's, if it's Nebraska, we're able to tell them to open a CAMPAC. We're able to, we know where they're all located. We know where all of the, um, how to request, but, you know, because we serve Wyoming, for instance, um, we would certainly make people aware, providers aware, um, this is what you need to do. Who, here's who you need to contact. You need to get your uh, coordinator, your state coordinator involved immediately. And it was already mentioned earlier, and, and I would love to meet you, by the way, um, and we probably need to talk more about this, your, your SNS coordinator on this call, but um, how you know, we can then get them 
um, plugged in immediately. And again, my staff knows there's two types. There's hospital Chempac, which has um, primarily vials, and then the EMS Chempac is primarily auto injectors, but they both contain both. We have those lists, and um, you know we would be able to, I think, get them quickly plugged into the resources they need. And Kathy, do you have a technology solution? That's great. It's very helpful. I, said, I, showed, I think that shows some of the value that we have. Somebody can call and get this information from us rapidly. Do you have a particular um, technology solution that you use to keep, sort of keep track of all of these things that you can get this information instantly and simultaneously? Um, it's we've got Excel spreadsheets. No, we don't have a great <laughs> solution there, um, but we, we do track. We do, you know, keep it up to date. And, um, you know, we do work closely with the, with the health department in that respect. And we also do disaster exercises. We've got some coming up and, you know, the focus for the healthcare coalitions this year is on chemical exposures. And, uh, so we're looking to, um, get some get the type of scenario like you, like you already brought up where we can make everybody aware of Kempac and, and exercise some of those request processes, which keeps my staff up to date. At least annually, um, internally, we go through the staff training as well, because, you know, I, I mean, initially what I usually ask them is, what would you do if the scenario occurred? And they're like, I, I would call Kathy. It's like, well, if I'm not available, what are you going to do? So we have a lot of redundancy and we do exercise that. Very nice. Uh, Dr. Lee. Um, I was just going to piggyback also, I can't believe I forgot to mention your state duty officer is a key person to also um, contact in all of this. And at least for us, you know, that's who we would reach out to if we need to activate the compact, um, the CAMPAC. And also for people who don't know, if you activate the CAMPAC or go in the room or do anything, the CDC will also be alerted. So um, whether or not, you know, they're aware or you should let them know because they will be calling you regardless. Yeah, very nice. So do you all, um, so Mike and John, do you both, um, so, you know, obviously, so mechanical ventilation is a very important uh, resource and a tool in a scenario like this. Do you, uh, do you keep track of during um, um, disasters like this, who has what outside of antidotes? Because that question's come up to us before about, you know, where to send patients specifically, and would you send them somewhere if their ICU was already sort of overwhelmed? Uh, we don't have things on ventilators. You know, my my closest thing is, you know, with COVID, we all kind of kept track of around ICU capacity and regular bed capacity around the state. And so I think that has probably increased that, even if it's not inside the poison center, that other state resources have some better knowledge about who has what sort of bed capacity. Uh, so I think we benefit from COVID in, in that sense, that communication, but it's not something I've known from a poison center standpoint about, for instance, ventilators or, or ICU bed status directly. Gotcha. We have certainly gone through the thought exercise when we've had incidents and uh, played, played it out. But real time, I don't know that we ever had or have. I think if we had an exposure like this, where ventilators were clearly a key part uh, of the response, we we would do that. That would be part of part of our our yeah. uh, our response. Yeah, yeah, no, that makes total sense. Um, and, and we have the leftover infrastructure, at least in Minnesota, to uh, from COVID to to do that. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, um, so a question for you all. Um, so this, so you know, these are some of the things that we talked about. Obviously, antidote availability is very important for us to sort of take the best care of our our patients that we can um in real time so outside of the antidote what other challenges have you all sort of run into when having to try to respond to and address any disasters like this what what can you can you talk about examples of challenges that you've had during these times i think i think uh i'm happy to start i've also happy to defer to you. I, I, the two things, there's two things that come to mind. The first is it's hard to convey how normal it is for things to be wildly confusing for the first few hours. And I, I can think of, um, uh, 
one event that we were involved in with the poison center where there was a chemical gas exposure at a local hotel and i think we went through and part of this is because some of the um names of certain things are very similarly uh they overlap a lot you know like phosgene and phosphine and phosgene oxime and that sort of thing Chlor chlorine chloramine and they don't all have the same treatments so that um I, I think is very confusing and that doesn't necessarily always change prognosis or change treatment but it does change prognosis and it does change um triaging in terms of the gas that you're exposed to if it's a gas so i think that expect the unexpected and expect confusion early and then the second um thing that i um have run into more than once is um, aggressive emergency physicians wanting to overtreat people who aren't that sick, uh, taking up resources, especially in the first wave of patients. Um, that that is a common hurdle. Gotcha, Dr. Lee. I think Dr. Cole already mentioned this, but PR media is going to be a huge time sucker, regardless of what you want to do. So you'll be busy trying to coordinate everything clinical but your PR rep is going to be emailing, texting you, calling you, and media is going to be wanting something. And you certainly don't want to wait too long because you don't want any misinformation or to cause panic because they don't have the information, but you do have to be able to balance that while you're trying to take care of the situation. Yep, very true. Dr. Moss? I was gonna mention about decontamination that I think was read very briefly at the beginning is and especially with Sarah, and it could be anything else. So the secondary effects of then contaminating healthcare workers and law enforcement and EMS and then taking people out. The opposite side is the desire to decontaminate too much or people being afraid to care for patients once they are decontaminated because they think they're a danger or going to tie up staff because you have to be completely in level A gear to go near the patient or something like that. And uh, helping people recognize what is the appropriate amount of decontamination. We certainly want them decontaminated. We want everyone to be safe, but we don't want it too far one direction or another where we end up exposing healthcare staff or we have people that aren't able to care for a patient because they're afraid to, to do so, um, which is, of course, difficult when we're dealing with the changing information and maybe not even knowing what's happening in the first place. Yeah, very true. So we've seen that scenario more than one time play itself out, as you mentioned, Mike. Um, Kathy? I think those are all great points. I would just add just just the um the need for healthcare facilities to you know, to want immediate information and we don't always know. Um an example of that would be Memorial Day of all days, you know, there was a we had a, a chemical factory that caught on fire and it was a large fire in the downtown Omaha area and uh you know, I I know the hospital folks so well, they were texting me at home going, all right, this is happening. You know, what, what do we expect? What are these chemicals? Well, the, the factory was closed. Fortunately, there was no one in there at the time, but we're talking a holiday and we had no way of knowing. We could only anticipate based upon some of the uh, chemicals that they produce that it could be corrosives, it could be respiratory irritants, you know, hydrocarbons. And we put out something general because they really um, expected that from us. Um, as the experts, and um, so we were general. Um, but what we put out ended up getting out the next day to the media because there was nothing else, you know. And so what we had put together, the medical director and I, you know, became um, really the information, and it was really general. So those are always challenging. They're very challenging for us um, when we don't really know what we're dealing with, but yet we, you know, we we provide the support we can. Yeah. So, you know, um, that also segues into another question I was going to have. So, you know, we've looked at this, this other issue and I, I'm curious to see how you all deal with this, but suppose if there's a, a, a disaster that happens, people go to a hospital. Do you get the phone call from worried family asking you where your, where their loved one is? And if so, what do you answer? Do you give them if they're at a hospital? As in I... they trying to locate their loved one. I can take that, I guess. Um, I don't know that that's something we routinely receive, but you know, if it is a large incident, then usually a family assistance center is set up 
um, and and uh, it, the sooner the better in a large incident, and we can refer them to that location. But early on, um, that could be a real challenge. We we haven't encountered that much though in our center, fortunately. Yeah, Dr. Banerjee. Um, yeah, you raise a good point about you know people will call the poison center for information that we might not have. So actually having some good referrals. Um, for some of those types of questions is super important for our, you know, the phone frontliners to have, um, you know, especially when if, if it's happened at a, a focal site, but the perimeter, like, how far out are we talking? How, to, how, how far is it affecting other people? Um, so you're going to get those people that are calling saying, should I find it? You know, should I do something empirically or, um. What do I do about my apartment? Can I not enter now? I mean, there, there's going to be questions that we cannot answer. And so I think it's super important to have some other phone numbers for people to kind of, you know, one, help them, but also get those calls out of the, the queue so you can actually help people that, that need, that we can help. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Um, and speaking of that, so speaking of help, how do you all sort of help each other? So are there strategies that poison centers use Inner poison center to inner poison center during disasters like this? I'm, I'm sure that surge is probably one of those, but can you talk about sort of like, you know, uh, mechanisms and strategies that poison centers can use to work together during big disasters? I mean, I think communication is, is our best um, tool here. Uh, just having resources for other, other centers that need help, or let's say we get calls uh, from hospitals that are in Wyoming, and we need to get them back over to the Wyoming Poison Center so they can follow local, you know, guidance. Um, the, and I think that's an understood thing with poison centers. We have procedures for that. So um, I think the best bet is just really, really good lines of communication. And we all know we're all willing to help each other out. Um, it is more of just, you know, if you stick with your local guidance. They might be a little bit different, little flair different than what we might do in Colorado. And so. Um, I think just recognizing that, you know, there's no distinct boundaries. Yeah, for sure. Kathy. No, I would just add, I think this was brought up, but um, when we would send out some of the hospitals still have old fashioned fax machine, they like us to blast fax that we also email things out. We will try to always make sure, you know, for instance, you know, we're, we're on the border. And so um, give the other poison centers a heads up. Um, that are surrounding the state or surrounding uh, the area so that, you know, we're all on the same page to the extent possible. I, I really appreciate that. I know when I hear from, let's say, not on the border uh, to um, Idaho, but of course, or I mean to Iowa, but Wyoming is on our, on our west border. And so if we know something's happening, let's say in western Nebraska, then, you know, we can give Wyoming um, Department of Health at least a heads up. So. Um, we do a lot of that communication. Very good. Well, excellent. Um, so thank you guys for, for talking about this. You know, obviously we're very passionate about our poison centers and uh, we could talk for days and days about all the things that we do to sort of uh, be, to help be there for the public and to be a, a valuable resource during a time of disaster. But I think we're going to um, shift it over and to uh, take questions that somebody might have from the audience uh, while we have these experts here to talk about them. So um, any questions from the audience? Caroline, I think we should, um, if we can monitor sort of the chat to make sure that people's questions are getting answered. Absolutely, Dr. Hoyt. It looks like there's no questions at this time. There are two comments, one about um, a resource and medical directors not being available um, at every facility. And then uh, one uh, gentleman sharing in New Mexico the use of the 211 system as opposed to the 911 system to help pull some of those requests away from hospital switchboards and 911 operators. Very nice. Um, I think so. Yeah, I think that there were um, some questions earlier. Um, some something about some pediatric questions. Should we read those, Caroline?
Yeah, absolutely. There were um, in the registration, there were two questions that were asked in advance related to pediatrics. One was about any national database for pediatric information um, related to chem events. And then the second was any guidance or information on dry versus wet decon for pediatric patients. So what do you all think about the question about pediatric information in databases? I guess I'm not exactly sure what that database question is about. We're certainly ready to give information out about managing adult or pediatric patients. I just pulled out the pre-prepared one pager we have on this exact attack. And oh, yep, we've got milligram per kilo pediatric dosing already listed here. It's ready to go when this happens, we're, we're set. Um, I don't know that I'd be doing anything terribly different for a child versus an adult that was exposed for this particular exposure, it will be the symptomatic treatment and, and decontamination. And for this thing, soap and water, you know, would be the decontamination. So I'm not sure about dry. Otherwise, here we're dealing with something that could, that would need to be washed off. So I don't know if there's other specifics about those two questions, but that's my take. We're ready to take care of adults as well as kids. And we take care of lots of kids every day at the Poison Center. So we're very used to it. Yeah, I agree with everything Dr. Moss said. I um, part of my question, I, I interpreted the question as, do you need to do anything different with children um, during the process of decontamination to just to get them to comply with the decontamination process? But I don't know that I would do anything different other than usual distraction methods in child life uh, if you have that as an as an option. And then the database question, I interpreted as a, like a almost as a source for research. And I actually think the national poison data system might be the best option for that because we collect data real time and contribute uh, real time uh, into the national database that uh, you know makes up cases from all 55 US poison centers. Um, and large, um, rare and large events like this are, are what the database is really good at. Yeah, agree. I, I, um... I was thinking the same thing that Dr. Moss was thinking about, I, I, you know, databases of information. I thought specifically to dosing, uh, but I think for the most part, uh, I think as Mike said, you know, most of the time you're going to do the, you know, you're going to treat these very similar to an adult. And so, uh, but we do have lots of information on pediatric dosing and other ways that, of medically managing pediatric um, uh, patients that come in after disasters. So we've got that. And, but Dr. Dr. Cole mentioned the MPDS um, is really excellent. It's huge, which is, it's one of its big strengths and it's near real time. And so um, we've got tons of data in that, um, in that particular database that is very, that's very pointed towards children. A lot of people don't recognize it, but in our database, um, and for most poison centers, the, we, you know, looking at demographics, um, most patients that we take care of are under the age of 18. In fact, like zero to five, that age range, it's almost like 40% of our of the total in, in PDS is that zero to five or zero to six, somewhere in their age range. So we're very, very comfortable in taking care of pediatric patients. So it looks like there was another question. I think it I think every hospital ideally has oh, there's a, a comment. Oh wait. Never mind. There's a question here. What recommendation do you have for the pediatric population? Please clarify the de decision points for both dry and wet or technical decon. Anybody have any response to that? I mean, in my former life, I was uh, spent 25 years with uh, Cheyenne Fire Rescue. Um, ran the hazmat team for a long period of that time. So was involved with going back to the early 2000s all the way through the white powder calls and dealing with all those things firsthand. Um, every situation is gonna be different. There is not a one size fits all. Um, a lot of what we thought we knew about decon has changed even up to now where, um, where we used to set up three pools and everybody got wet. Um, that's not the best way to do things anymore. So. Again, you, the general rule is you're trying to keep dry things dry. So if whatever format they use to, or whatever they use to carry their chemical weapon was dry, we wanna keep it dry. And um, we've gone down to more um, specific types of almost wipes that do specific things for chemical weapons. Um, and, and we've almost gone away from the mass, mass showers, um, 
although that could be uh, in a, a large number like the scenario you gave us, if you had several hundred people at once, that might be the most efficient, but that creates a whole host of other problems with runoff and containment and all those other things. So again, I would say the best resource for that would be knowing your local hazmat teams, uh, working with your uh, fire department officers that are in charge of those kind of things. I'm probably most familiar with the uh, Denver metro area because I've worked with them a lot, whether it's Denver Fire, you know, South Metro, North Metro, um, they all have teams that uh, since 9-11 have literally been given millions of dollars in training and millions of dollars of equipment just to handle that. So having that on your resource list. Um, and if you don't have that, um, most of us all have, I know all these states that are in, on this meeting have fusion centers. Um, if you're not on that monthly call, you probably should be because that's a fusion center between EMS, hospital coalitions, um, law enforcement, and, and, and they're constantly monitoring the web for vulnerabilities and those kind of things. And that's their job was to basically cancel that gap that allowed 9-11 to happen and some of those following events to happen because nobody was communicating. So we all have state and federal fusion centers that help monitor the, uh, the threats and the realities of those uh, events. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's a lot. Of, yeah, a lot of great information there. I think um, this is it, it. Sort of underscores sort of the stuff you're talking about, Steve. It underscores the reason to think these things ahead of time and really be prepared because that's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of things to think about um, when you know things are chaotic, like John Cole um, was describing earlier. Um, so I think every so Hillary um, says I think every hospital ideally has some pediatric considerations built into their decon plan: warmer water, lower water pressure, dry blankets. Try not to separate parents; very important. Make sure smaller children have a bucket or a basket uh, to be placed in. Yep, agreed. Um, Megan Martin said kids with slippery consider using laundry basket or car seat to avoid falls while they are soapy. Also have. Um, have to consider pediatric body temp can lower more easily. Yep, I think that that doesn't get thought of um, to your point, Megan, uh, but you're right, should be in every sort of checklist for pediatric decon. Clint said, is anyone aware of training resources regarding decontamination of household pets? I found some contractors who can provide training, but at a very high cost. I do not know of any, anybody know any training on that particular issue? No. So, uh, good, uh, good point, Clint. I, Clinton. Excuse me. I don't know. I have not seen that, but um, be happy to look, look at some information on that. Um, Hillary said, the "Correct will depend on chemical exposure, amount of exposure." Okay, she was responding to something, and then Dr. Banerjee made a response, and Clinton. So, okay. Well, it's three fifty-eight, um, and so I think we're going to close. So, Caroline, I think you wanted to close down. Thank you, Dr. Hoyt, and thank you to the panelists, Dr. Cole, Dr. Banerjee, Dr. Hoyt, Dr. Jacobitz, Dr. Lee, and Dr. Moss. We sincerely appreciate your time today um, and for sharing your experience and thoughts on this expert and informative webinar. Um, at the end of this webinar, we wanted to share a couple of items, including how to connect with us. Uh, we have two ways to connect directly with us, uh, one through our Mountain Plains RDHRS website, which also enables uh, connecting with our newsletter. And then we have a X formerly Twitter handle at MPRDHRS. We would also love for your feedback um, in a, uh, the, uh, for a survey on how to improve future webinars and any feedback you might have for this webinar. And then as always, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to email us at mountainplainsrdhrs.org or rdh at dhha.org. Um, and next week, we will also be sharing a recording of this webinar for future reference that will be available on our website. Um, and this will also include the post-survey webinar. Um, any and all feedback is welcome. And again, thank you everyone for your time. We sincerely appreciate you joining us today on this February 5th. Um, hope you all have a wonderful day. Goodbye. Goodbye.